There's a win all around in it, and it starts spatially. You know, it starts by kind of uh, the neighborhood is, is sort of the rails that we put our behavior on, right? And so we 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 create those conditions, and then our and our choices then run on them later. You want to make you want to make that running of behavior super easy in the direction that you want it to go. You don't want it to be a struggle. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that is Blaine Merker, a partner and director and head of climate action at Gale. And uh, he is based in San Francisco, but Gale, of course, uh, has offices in San Francisco, New York, and headquarters in Copenhagen. Uh, I am delighted to share this with you. We're gonna be talking about a whole bunch of different topics, but ultimately we're talking about cities are for people and the importance of taking action now uh, for our health, our well-being, and also climate. So without further ado, let's get right to it with Blaine Merker. Blaine Merker, uh, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. So Blaine, I'd love to have you just uh, introduce yourself to the audience. So who is Blaine? Well, um, thanks, John. I am, I'm a landscape architect by training and, and sort of radicalized urbanist by life experience. And I have had some funny twists and turns in my career that took me from kind of professional design to activism to entrepreneurship and you know starting some different companies and organizations but the the thread for me has always been streets it's been public space it's been kind of being an active citizen and participant of the cities that i've lived in and trying to unlock that experience for other people as much as i can so i i sort of feel really lucky that i've been able to do professionally what my what my passion is, which is really creating cities for people. And I do that currently in a professional role as a director and a partner at Gale. We're a, an urban design and strategy consultancy, and we get to do work all over the world. And it's really fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Yen is uh, is obviously a huge inspiration for many of us and, and, and me, myself. You know, it's like this book, uh, you know, the, which came out in 2010, you know, some 13 years ago, um, was really part of the inspiration for me to uh, found my nonprofit, Advocates for Healthy Communities, which I did a year later in 2011, and then launched the Active Towns Initiative in uh, 2013, so a decade ago. Uh, so I've been kind of like, you know, doing this and, and, and talking about this, my filter that I kind of run things through is through a lens of how the built environment encourages healthy, active living. So that's my formal training is as an exercise physiologist and in working in disease prevention for the first 15 years of my career. And then, you know, making that shift back in uh, basically in 2010, really starting to focus on the built environment. And one of the things I didn't know about you until, you know, I started prepping for, for our little interview here today was that little activist side of you and was this history so talk about rebar, man. This is this is good stuff. Yeah, it, it, this is such a fun chapter in my career, and it sort of has a long tail uh, of of uh, influence on my my professional work and just great people that I got to know and worked with over the over the years that uh, that I co-founded and ran rebar. So you know what you're what you're showing here is probably rebar's most well-known project called parking day and i'll back up by saying that rebar is is and was a art collective and design studio that was founded in 2004 2005 by some some folks who just kind of got together and cared about streets and wanted to do projects that there really wasn't sort of a client for, but we felt like we're urgent. This was coming out of grad school for me. I was uh, I was studying landscape architecture at UC Berkeley and kind of getting into my my final year, starting starting to graduate, got a job as a landscape architect doing urban design and park planning in San Francisco. And while this was happening, some friends and I got interested in just doing installations in public space. The, the first one in the city that we did was called Parking Day. We, we just 
had this notion that a parking space was a bit of untapped real estate. You know, re- you know, real estate was super expensive. You could rent a parking space, 10 by 20 feet for like $2 an hour. And we thought, is there, you know, is there any rule that says you can't put something other than a car in that parking space? So we kind of ran through a few different ideas and we landed on this idea of a park because it's really legible and easy to imagine. And we, we built a public park in a parking space. So that was kind of the first iteration and you, you put up the manual there. So people started contacting us from around the world saying, can you come do this in our city? We were contacted by folks in Germany and Australia and Italy. We'd spent the sort of last $500 we had building this temporary park in San Francisco. And so we published a manual, kind of an open source how-to. And what was really interesting about that is it just took off. People started build, building parks in their in their cities that kind of led to what a lot of folks are maybe more familiar with, which is the parklet movement. And that that really started in San Francisco. Uh, we had folks from the planning department come and approach us and say, how do we do this all year? We helped craft the, the ordinance with them and the pilot program that developed the first parklets in the world. And so now you you kind of walk around any U.S. city or abroad and you will see you will see parklets around and we don't rebar no longer has anything to do with them. They're just, they're, they're created by, you know, folks in those cities. And this, this manual, is it still accessible? Can people still access this? It is. If you go to myparkingday.org, you can okay. find the, the, the manual, you can find a map, you can find resources for uh, participating in parking day. So we, we actually set one day a year on Friday in September uh, and it's posted on the on the website when you can participate. And we we wanted to kind of focus global right. participation on that one day so people could really have a sense of like the, you know, the excitement and and see it all happening and tour around their cities. Yeah. And what's really extraordinary about this, and I and I talk about this a lot on the Active Towns podcast, is it's one of those initiatives. It's it's something that I, I refer to over and over and over again as the software. Uh, the hardware, of course, is the stuff that we build and we have out in the physical environment. And we can put a pin in a map and say, hey, we've got a, a park over here. We've got a pool over there. We've got a protected bike lane running through this area here. And, uh, and, and that's the hardware. That's the infrastructure. But something like this is the software. It's it's the engagement activities. It's the awareness programs and policies that we can you know implement that can not only activate the hardware, but it can also change the perceptions and change the 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 dynamic um, of of how we see our streets and how we see our public spaces. And so I love it. I, I think that that's just it's fabulous. And uh, and again, I had no idea that that you were part of that. I obviously have known about it and have participated in it and have filmed it in various cities and locations, but uh, good, good stuff, man. What a great, uh, a great, you know, heart, you know, start in, in terms of in this world and then uh, making that transition uh, over here to, to Gale Arch. I almost said Gale Architects. It used to be Gale Architects. Now it's Gale it's just we 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 drop the architects. We just go with Gail because you know we we sort of realized a few years ago that architects is a little exclusionary. It's a little it's a little designy. It's a little maybe too specific to design. I think just just as you mentioned, we're interested in the hardware. We're interested in the software. We're interested in the strategy that kind of or, organizes design um, at a very high level. So you know I think this 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 slide here. Um, which is focusing on public life. This is really what we're trying to design and enable. And that goes far beyond architecture. So that's why we dropped that word and we're just Gale. So public life, you know, is sort of what, what our, what our mission is about creating, you know, the life that we make together in public. And I, I, I just love what you said about uh, sort of, sort of revealing the, um, the agency that we all have in making that. I think we kind of walk around our world thinking this is just how it is. I don't know. The engineers made it this way. This must be how it's supposed to be. And what, the, you know, the project that I was involved in with Rebar for, you know, over a decade and now with Gail is trying to sort of reveal the world as a place that we make actually. And we can shape that hardware if we become aware of it. And that hardware then shapes our behavior. So it's this kind of a, a cycle. 
Yeah. Which is a big part of, of the book. You know, when we look at uh, the book Cities for People, you know, that's a part of it. And it's part of, you know, Yen's story, too, in terms of, you know, being a classically trained architect and then really having, you know, sort of the input from his wife, you know, who had the the psychology side of things and going, wait a minute, you know. <laughs> uh, and so it, it's a beautiful story. And if anybody, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read that book, I mean, it is a classic. Yes, it is 13 years old now, but it, it's phenomenal. Uh, he has older pieces of work as well, but I think it really came together uh, quite beautifully in that particular Island Press uh, edition uh, because it's full color and it really, you know, brings you, brings it to life. And there's so many great uh, memories that I have of Yen and one-liners that he has. I mean, I, I just mentioned it the other day was a one-liner that he had in Contested Streets, which was a documentary way back when, probably, again, probably almost 10, 13 years ago. And uh, the, the, there was a couple of, of great one-liners in there, but one of them that I repeat often is him expressing the joy of knowing that every day when he would wake up, the city was just a little bit better than it was the day before. Um, and then another quote that I love from, it might've been from that movie or a different uh, location, was a, a quote of how incremental change can actually add up. And he was talking about how in Copenhagen they were trying to, you know, decrease on-street parking uh, by about 2% per year. And if you do that year after year after year, it's so little that it doesn't, you know, garner much resistance. And, it, you know, you don't get that sort of knee-jerk reaction of, res of, of nimbyism and, and, and change and, and fight. But at the same time, it, if you're consistent with that change, it really makes a big difference over time. So those two, two quotes really uh, have stuck with me. There's others like the scale of buildings and, and not getting too high, which we can get into later. Uh, but it's really foundational, obviously, to the firm. Uh, how is, yeah, the last time I saw him was in uh, 2018. So it, it was prior to the pandemic. He is doing great. And, you know, does as far as I can tell, does not stop touring and speaking and being Jan in the world. I think he, he, he gets a lot of energy from being in front of an audience. And, um, and one of the things that you, you mentioned about him, which is totally true is he's, he's kind of unfiltered. And even though he's got a script that he's been on for 50 years, practically about is very simple. He, he's a little unscripted too. And he says, he really says what's on his mind. So he ends up with these, these great kind of quips that are maybe, uh, some of us are almost too polite to say in planning circles, but he just kind of says says what he what he thinks, and I think that's part of the power of his message. But he stepped, you know, he stepped away from the practice at Gale, the the company entirely. He's now he's now fully retired, and so really one of the the projects that we're you know in right now is is transitioning this this brand and this organization, which is so identified with him and so building on his legacy and lifting up the new leadership that we have, which is, you know, we've got, I think, seven or eight um, partners now. We've got a team of about 140 people in three offices. So we are a new company that is that is much bigger than than Jan and, and doing incredible work all over the world and trying to get that that message out there is kind of the next iteration of the story. Yeah. And it's, it's such a great legacy. And I know that he is incredibly proud. And again, 300 plus cities around the world, y'all are doing work in um, and looking at the fact that, yeah, you've got the Copenhagen office, the, the main office there, and then uh, New York and San Francisco. Uh, now, is Jeff still at the, the San Francisco or has he gone uh, to the Copenhagen? Jeff is in Copenhagen and okay. Jeff is, yeah, Jeff, Jeff Rissom is in Copenhagen. He's, he's, he lives there. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he married a Dane and they have a, a family that I, I go visit whenever I'm there. And I, I look at his house with sort of envy and wonder a little bit. He lives <laughs> kind of in like suburban Copenhagen. Yeah, and yeah. It's like a long ride, you know, from the office, but you get to his, his house and, it's just this like modest collection of sort of two story homes with this car free or car light kind of wonder connecting them. And, you know, I'll say like, Jeff, where, where are your kids? And he's like, I don't know. His kids are like, you know, 
Yeah. Nine, nine and t- <laughs> 11. And it's like, I don't know. They're just in the neighborhood. You know, and I'm like, God, I would, I would be arrested if, if my kids were just in the neighborhood. But of course for, for him, you know, it's about neighbors taking care of the kids and they're, they're very safe uh, yeah, running around. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's, that's part, one of the themes that we have here. I mean, this is kind of what they, how they, they grow up, you know, they're, they're at this stage and, and they're out and about and, you know, absorbing all of this. And then before you know it, you know, they are free range kids. Actually, John, put, put that picture back up again, because the, the, with the kids, because these, those kids are are my kids actually. Oh, wow. And I yeah. just, just wanted to share, just wanted to share this, which yeah. is that, um, you know, I, I go to Copenhagen a few times a year to, to be in the office. And um, I had the opportunity to bring my two boys with me last uh, summer. And part of that was I, I wanted to radicalize them with the experience <laughs> of being in a city that yeah. was made for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so they just, you know, I got, I, I rented this, this, uh, this cargo bike and, and just kind of pedaled them. I spent like a week pedaling them around the city and they thought it was yeah. super fun. Well, it's a, a classic Christiana bike manufactured right there in, in the little enclave of Christiana, uh, which is super, super cool. Yeah. And they, and that's the same company that, uh, manufactures the, the Trishaw bikes, uh, that cycling without age uses and, and does. So it's good, good stuff. And so, I guess that's one of the things that I'd love for us to talk a little bit about is uh, when we are actually successful at building cities for people, it becomes much more empowering so that, you know, this type of lifestyle, this type of mobility choice becomes much more practical and pragmatic um, and one would even say possible. You know, sometimes what happens is in, in, in other car oriented cities, uh, you know, a, a bike lane gets slapped down or whatever. And, and, and they say there, be happy. It's possible. You can do it, but it's certainly not inviting and welcoming. And when it becomes inviting and welcoming, truly people oriented, we're able to start to see some behavior change. That's right. And I, you know, I chose these photos because I, I love doing this whenever I go to Copenhagen, this is, this is right outside our office. And so I'll just, you know, come down and just, just photograph people biking. Cause what you see is you see a few things you see really a human centered operating system that is sort of unquestionably consistent that there is a certain amount of space designed for cyclists. There's a certain amount of clarity to it but it's also not precious really and it's not sort of like we have this kind of highly engineered approach to streets and there sometimes you'll see yeah the bike lane's got to shrink down a little bit or it gets bigger and there's there's an opportunism to it which is you know you have these the 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 danish cycling engineers are kind of saying well make it as good as you can and if you can make it for wide enough for two people to ride side by side, let's do that because people like to talk. And, and and then you'll see, you know, a little bit of asphalt maybe that gets slapped down to just ease the uh, dismount from a curb into an area of parking or a driveway. And, you know, that's sort of added after the fact. It's just slapped down. We you would never see that in the U.S. because that would have to get into the construction drawings. I don't think it's in the construction drawings in in Denmark. It's it's in an engineer's or a or a public works person's head that hey, you should watch how people use the street. And if you see something happening, it's this idea of this incremental improvement, right? If you see something happening, if you see human behavior starting to nudge in a particular direction, you know, help it out. It's as Jan would say, it's it's cheap to be kind. It's cheap to be kind to people. You know, all you need is a little bit of asphalt and some time. Well, what you just said there, it, you know, brings up this, you know, photo it, and, you know, you, observing human behavior and seeing what the user experience is. And, you know, this is a classic, you know, desire line photo. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so the the engineer and, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a landscape architect, right? So I'm, I'm counting myself as part of the problem. We, you know, we we think we've got the answer. You can't believe how many different times designers talk about, I will do it this way to make people do this. Right. And the, you know, the, the Gale mindset really tries to be, 
the user is always right. If if somebody chooses to invest in an action with their energy and behavior, it's because they're rational and they have calculated that it is either the safest or the most enjoyable or the quickest thing for them to do. And that matters. And then we as designers need to sort of look at that and design accordingly. Um, so that's, and, and, and do it with data if we can, by observation. Yeah. Well, and, and, and data and observation, and that takes us again, right back to some of the roots of, of, of Jan's work in terms of, of going out and just observing public life and really understanding how people behave in, in the public realm. I think he also wrote a book about that too. <laughs> so, um, I, I want to bring us back to uh, active transportation since this is the Active Towns podcast. So one of the, the things that uh, caused me to reach out to you and, uh, and, and have this conversation was the uh, it was a couple of different things. One, it was a it, it was basically a post that you had that you know brings back this image in my mind. I can't remember if it was on Twitter or if it was on LinkedIn. And specifically, there it was two of them, but this was one of them. It was this one here. And you, you know, you're you're making the the point here. Or I'll let you make the point. It's written here, but uh, you know. Go ahead and, 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 and riff off of this and, and uh, drive home what you were trying to articulate here. Uh, I think it was about a month yeah. ago. That's just, this is funny. And it's, it's, it's funny that this is the one that you picked up on, actually, because this is me using LinkedIn, which is, you know, the, the sort of um, MS-DOS of, of social networking. is not, not the most sexy one, but I was, I was just trying to organize people in my neighborhood to uh, weigh in on the redesign for this greenway, which is called the Ohlone Greenway. This goes through Berkeley, Albany, and El Cerrito in the, in the East Bay of San Francisco. It's part of, part of really a great, I would say a great potential greenway network here in the East Bay. And what makes it so, so special, as you can see, there's kind of a viaduct off to one side. It, it aligns with the BART system, which means that it, catches a bunch of, you know, regional high capacity commuter rail stations. And to me, this is magic. This, when you are able to get a active human scale mobility, sort of super highway of a greenway intersecting with regional transit, you're unlocking both the neighborhood and the region at the same time, not using cars. And you're building in healthy commute to work, you know, because this is about a third of a mile away from, from the train station that I use to get into the city to the office. It, it's, it's virtually co-located with the downtown San Francisco financial district. And yet it's this kind of like suburban active greenway. So there's something really special here. And this is where my kids learn to bike. This is where we, we go out, it's where I run every day. And I honestly, you know, didn't really see it for years of, you know, of living here. And then suddenly realized that there was this gem. And I, I was organizing people, I posted this on LinkedIn because I was organizing people to say, hey, we have a chance to invest some money in this. It's about to be upgraded. We need to treat this like we would treat a regional highway with the dollars and attention that that would get, because this is a, it's a human scale piece of infrastructure. It's also a piece of climate infrastructure. It's really special and we should sort of engage and, and, and people have, and I, and that, that design is underway right now. And I, I hope that we get a really great upgrade to the. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah. And, and you can see why it, it sort of reminded me of, of this image here. It, you know, the, uh, not that image, this image, come back here, guys. There you go. That image, similar that's type it. of that's thing. Our, that's our greenway. Yeah. 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 This you is just a, a, a regular sort of, you know, Saturday afternoon and on the greenway and it's, you know, packed with really, I mean, I think really packed with kids, with older folks, with people exercising. And there's this kind of, um, it's, you know, it's an entry point, I think for people to have a human centered experience, even in neighborhoods that aren't. So it's, it's, you know, you really see this is where people feel safe to, to take their kids out. 
Well, and it seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, I may have a wrong assumption here, but it, it seems to me uh, that there is a level of connectivity the, the, in the lower left here of the photo here. looks like it's ve- very uh, cohesive with the neighborhood. So it, are you able to get to meaningful de- to and from meaningful destinations using this greenway? You are, and it crosses so it crosses a number of sort of you know high streets and shopping streets along the way. You know, as I said, because it 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 uses an alignment of the the rail, um, which is active. Uh, it's quite connected that way too. I will say honestly, in in the U.S., I think we sort of are in this partitioned mindset. We think about bike infrastructure, and we think about transit infrastructure and we think about shopping streets but we don't always connect the dots and when you hear when you hear a you know a danish person or a dutch person often talking about cycling it's not such a special thing right we saw that in the pictures you know the clothes that people were wearing in those photos i mean some of them are like going to a, a meeting some of them are you know just kind of it's a little bit messy and casual because they're not biking. They're not actually like, I'm going to go for a bike ride. Correct. They are, yeah. they are saying, I am going to go be a person and shop. And cycling is, is an extension of just being and getting around the city and, and being really being a pedestrian. Actually, it's more like being a pedestrian than it is like, you know, something else. <laughs> it's like, kind of, it's you know, pedestrian sort of plus. cyclism. Yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. It's the it's concept like of pedestrian plus. It's, it's the, you know, this is a, an image of the snake uh, there in Copenhagen, you know, the, the winding uh, bridge. And, you know, it's, it's a critical connector of getting people to, there's a movie theater there. There's all sorts of residential over there. And, and I think where you were also heading with that is that, you know, in, in the U S frequently we see this and we see these facilities and oftentimes we think, Oh, recreational opportunity. Yeah. And in or exercise, what's really, really brilliant about the, the Danish approach and the Dutch approach. And in many cases, the German approach is that they're, they're like, it's this and it's this. In other words, yeah, you could totally use this for recreation, but the connectivity and the cohesiveness to meaningful destinations has been baked in. And so it can be both. It's an activity asset, as I like to call them, uh, that also happens to be a critical connector to meaningful destinations on a day to day basis. And so then you do see the images like, again, on the bottom left here of just normal attire going about one's daily business. I think that's so right. And, you know, my experience of, of the, of Nordic cycling and, and, and Dutch cycling is really that it's, it's, it's practical first. It's always about connecting destinations and sort of helping people get, get on and about their daily lives. And the, actually the, the beautiful cycle bridge in the, on the right-hand side is, is an important connector, but I don't think that is the vibe of most of the infrastructure in those countries. I mean, they have some wonderful things, but really the vibe is more the lower left. If, if you're just going to add up by quantity and so it's, that's, it's just, it's informal, it's practical. And then every once in a while you get these kind of like amazing pieces of infrastructure to make, to make connections. Um, well, and in the but, top, uh, in yeah. the, the, the top left, I mean, that's a great example of some infrastructure there in Copenhagen, which is really serves as public space. And if I remember correctly, that's along, a, a believe, a, an old abandoned railway corridor where mm-hmm. you see all sorts of it's both a cycling route, but there's also these pop up parks and installations. I shouldn't use the word pop up. I mean, they're well established uh, by this time, but they emerged over time and evolved over time of being uh, it, it is a linear park or series of parks, as well as a transportation corridor for active mobility. Yeah, that's right. That's, you know, a, a well known uh, park design called Super Keelan um, that I mean, one of the things that's special about that particular spot is it's a kind of a multi multicultural, multi ethnic neighborhood in in Copenhagen and Nürburgring, and it's it's really a quite diverse place. 
And when I took this picture the last time I was there and I just, there were just happened to be a band playing and then people went up on the hill and were kind of watching it. And I ended up having a bunch of sort of fun conversations with different folks. It wasn't, I wasn't there to see that. It just, that was what was happening. And, you know, there's enough kind of integration with the public realm that a piece of transportation infrastructure is sort of in synergy with the public space. There's enough room you know, it sort of expands and there's enough room to have a band set up randomly without a permit to just kind of gather people. And then meanwhile, you know, the cycling is still happening. So it's, again, it's not like the cycle infrastructure is one thing and the public realm is another. They're, they're really merged it's, into yeah. one l- l- sort of living room of, of the urban life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's one of the things that, that I say over and over and over again is that you know, streets are for people. Streets have been around for literally thousands of years, ever since we've been coming together in, in villages and, and human habitats. And so it, it is kind of like that, that concept of, oh yeah, that's right. You know, streets, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's part of our, our, our public realm. And in fact, um, I believe you've got a slide in here. Streets are like 80% of the public realm, correct? Yeah, it sort of you know it varies by city, of course, because of course every city's yeah. got its own its own block structure. But I mean, to me, sort of, I think this was um, this was a statistic that I ran into, I think back in grad school, that there there was an analysis done by someone at UC Berkeley that had sort of tallied up the amount of space in cities and how much was streets and how much was buildings, and it you know. It turns out that streets, I think when you, when you pull this up, I'll check my memory here, but it's, you know, it's a quarter to a third of a, of a city's space is streets. So, right. you know, just, just the city itself is significantly, in fact, mostly it's, it's probably the single biggest use of any, any particular use is streets. Right. And then if you, if you take all that space together, it's actually quite a bit more than all of the other spaces like parks and plazas that we sort of traditionally think of as public space. So for me, this was kind of a, an eye opener. I mean, you know, here's this thing that is our shared commons, you know, in cities. And right. we've somehow kind of agreed that it's okay that it's devoted to just one thing for the most part, which is mo- movement. Yeah, here we go. Um, you know, so 20, 20 to 30 percent of the city is its streets. And then that taken together, that 20 to 30 percent is 80 percent of its public space. So, I, you know, I think just how do we bring that same attention and sort of intention to the design of that space as we do to our parks and recognize that movement is an important thing, but it is not the only thing. And it, it feeds other activities. And certainly automobile movement is, is just one kind. And I think, you know, our commons should be sort of shaped by people, not necessarily given over just to the domain of experts to tell us uh, what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of the domain of experts and, uh, and, and thinking about all this kind of stuff, the other post out on LinkedIn that caught my attention that you put out there was basically you sort of applauding, but at the same time calling out uh, a couple of electric vehicle manufacturers who shall remain nameless because I'm not going to put that post up here. But you were basically, you know, just kind of calling them out saying because they were acknowledging that electric vehicles are not going to save us from the climate challenge that we have. And you were like, yeah, hey, congratulations for admitting that. Da, 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 da. Uh, look forward to seeing you in the e-bike market. So let's use that as a, a, a transition point to talk a little bit about the, the work that you are actually actively doing in, in terms of climate action and within, you know, within Gale. And, and most importantly, uh, what you were pointing out, I believe here, is that yeah, we need to be thinking about active mobility in this equation. We can't just think about the electrification of our, our automobile fleet. Yeah. So this is so important because the, the reason that I posted that, um, and, and I think the original post came came through on the micromobility newsletter, so I'll, I'll give them the hat tip for, for calling it out, was that, you know, a couple of of electric vehicle manufacturers actually did a life cycle assessment of their electric vehicles and sort of, I, you know, the, the way I understood their, their, um, 
their report was that if you just electrified everything and, you know, there's a, there's, there's a movement out there called electrify everything. It's, it's the right answer. We should electrify everything. But if you just electrify the movement of two ton hunks of metal, you, you kind of eventually get into the sort of doom loop where you have to, it, it, there's so much energy intensity in, in building those two ton hunks of metal that you are unable to actually get to net zero through the electrification of our electric of our vehicle fleet. And so if we just sort of continue on the path that we're on, I mean, we should have electrical ve- electric vehicles, we should absolutely make all vehicles electric, but we cannot get to a net zero for the planet. We can't keep to the 1.5 degree target in any way uh, by keeping the same number of cars that we have now. And so this was an acknowledgement that these companies made. There's like, hey, we love selling these things, but like this actually is not the solution. So I think that's a, a great thing to exemplify. And I say the same thing is that, yes, we do need to electrify the fleet, but we need to shrink the size of the fleet. In other words, we need less motor vehicles out there. We need more people being able to have environments such as this that can help us encourage active mobility. And I think that's such a, a, a key part of, yes, places are for people. Public spaces are more for, than just transit, more than just moving through. But yes, you know, activity and, and movement does need to happen. And so we need to have that balance. And, and so we end up seeing, you know, designs such as this, where uh, we do have a place for the storage of motor vehicles. And we're going to we're going to leverage that storage of those motor vehicles on the street and call that protection. <laughs> They're going to be parking protected. Uh, and then you have your, your active mobility zones of, uh, you know, of the bike. You've got, you know, the, the, the slow human zone of walking and we've got, you know, the, the, the tree area here. Um, if I were to redesign this, you know, and you, you, as a landscape architect, you would probably predict what I would say. I'd probably want those trees to be on the other side, uh, you know, and, and and kind of get even more protection over there for, uh, you know, the people on bikes. Or better yet, let's plant two rows of trees. Absolutely. And, and I, I, you know, I included this because it's a it's a very typical design in Copenhagen, Um be, and one of the things that sort of is part of the design ethos there is this predictability that you 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 always have a kind of a gradient from mechanized to protected that you put your most you know your slowest and most vulnerable users against against the the buildings and then there are these kind of layers of of uh, speed that emanate out from that and you know, one of the things that doesn't show up maybe super well in this photo is there is a curb, right? So between the bike lane and the, and the track and the parking, there actually is, is always a curb, which is tough for us to get in the U S because of our, our, uh, ADA requirements. So it's a lower curb though. It, it's, it's a lower know, compared curb. to, like yeah, two, compared yeah. to ours, which are, are typically six to seven inches. Yeah. That's a much lower yeah. curb. So, you know, on the, on the climate topic, I mean, you, 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 sort of turned us there. And I, I, I should mention, I'm, so the other role that I have at Gale is I, I am the head of climate action at Gale, which is just a kind of a, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the expert in everything climate. I'm not in charge of all things climate. What I am is the, the connector and I think sort of the direction setter and the accountability holder for us to connect our human-centered design of cities and neighborhoods to climate action. And this is really building on this, this hypothesis that we've had for a long time, but I don't think have, have really been explicit about that. There's something about human centeredness that actually does equate to lower emissions. And what I'm really engaged in right now is trying to quantify that and make it really explicit how those two things are tied. Because we are in a, in a world now of we need to we need to count carbon, unfortunately. And I don't think we can just kind of wave our hands as urbanists or active mobility advocates anymore and say it's, 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 it's probably the best thing for the planet. We actually need to show how it is. 
Yeah. And you kind of have split this up into, you know, how we move, how we consume and how we build. And we do need to be changing and thinking about all of these areas. Um, Obviously, I focus a lot on how we move, you know, from an active mobility perspective. But ultimately, you also have to think about change how we build and where we're living And, you know, that whole built environment, because if your land use patterns are such that, you know, where we are building and how that is structured, you know, it makes it very, very difficult. So looking at the typical North American suburban context of, you know, very, very far distances, it makes it that much more difficult to have transit be a viable option. It can be, unless you have lots of those really cool pathways uh, underneath those viaducts, uh, it, it makes it very difficult to, to use active mobility, such as, as bikes and e-scooters. Although I will say that we're starting to see a really a sea change of opportunity with electric assist bicycles being able to help us travel longer distances than we really kind of considered in this realm, you know, just even five years ago. Absolutely. And, you know, we, I think there's tremendous potential for sort of the cycle superhighway, e-bike infrastructure, like combining these long distance with, with electric, electric, uh, electric bikes and really just kind of changing the commute because this is often like the, the commute is the one thing that is pretty hard to deal with as a, as a local transportation issue, because people work where they need to work and people work regionally. And, you know, you might be able to shift someone's, you know, shopping, shopping routine to maybe a local store, but it's very hard to tell someone, oh, you have to work in your neighborhood. You know, that's just like, not, that's not really viable. So we, we really need to think about, I think electric, electric bikes, great sort of cycling super highways. You can see these in, in, in Denmark and, and uh, uh, the Netherlands and in Germany now much more. I mean, I think these greenways that I was showing have a real potential to be that. And then the other piece is transit and sort of having regional transit be connected to those cycle super highways. It's just a magical unlock. All of a sudden you've got regional mobility, you know, that is active and human centered and you're not asking anybody to, do something impossible, you know, which is be late for work. Yeah. One of the things that I'd love to, you know, kind of do is, uh, is talk a little bit more about, I just mentioned it in in passing there of the built environment and, and building more density into our everyday life and, uh, and having it be sort of in that context of softer density or gentle density. And, and in fact, to, to, you know, promote another book here. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of books at Gale that, that we, yep, this is, yeah, this is my colleague, David Sim, um, who, who worked on this book for a couple of years at, at, at Gale. And, and uh, we actually used, I mean, this is sort of, da- you know, David put this together as, as a culmination of decades of thought about how to take some of the principles of, you know, really that, that we sort of had applied to public space, which is like humanness and watching how people really use space and kind of the, the, the gentler details that make a city kind and try and apply it to density and housing. So, you know, this, this is the same, this, these, these four diagrams are the same amount of density, right? You, you can you can have density in so many different ways. In in our vocabulary in the U.S. around density, we sort of understand the single family home, and then we understand the top left idea, which is yeah. a sort of it's and, either and high may, rises and maybe and maybe the top right, and maybe the maybe the top right. But this is you know when you get people kind of who are afraid of height and density, this is the image that they have, right? Especially so, this right next to their single family home. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can, I can talk to you about what we're dealing with here in Berkeley around, you know, densification in, in single family neighborhoods. It's, it's a, it's a really live, live and scary conversation for a lot of well, folks. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a live and scary conversation that's, that's happening everywhere. I mean, it kind of bubbles up in terms of uh, even here in, in Austin, Texas, the reason why our land use code reform never went through is because of just what you just said, is that, that gut reaction, that fear and some of the misinformation that gets that spread, that what we're talking about 
is either of the two uh, on the top there, you know, either the left or the right without any appreciation that, you know, oh, by the way, you know, maybe that bottom right guy, gosh, guys, you know, that's, that's kind of Paris, <laughs> you know, that exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of, I guess the, the thing I want to be an evangelist for here, and I, I think Dave would say this too, is, is you can have your cake and eat it. I mean, so actually, if you if you sort of go back to the to the last um, image there, so you know the the top is this kind of tip, maybe a typical American like parking you know parking lot apartment building, right? Which is you've got a you've got a vertical access core in the center, and then you've got light on one side. You've got the two units off to either side. People don't like living with light on one side. The reason we, one of the reasons we love single family homes so much, why you identify with them is that they, they have light on two sides. So every room kind of feels airy and there's actually a more dense urban form that gives you light on two sides, which is thinner buildings and courtyard blocks. And I know that, you know, you've had other guests on the show that have talked about this too. And it's, it's, I think something that we're moving towards just starting to explore in the U S California is reexamining its, its building code to allow for some of the changes that would unlock light on two sides buildings. But I, I guess, you know, there's a few interconnected ideas here, which is that number one, dense amenities strung along, uh, um, streets and bike lanes and our mobility system, those dense amenities, make the transportation system work. When you have something like this, you can you can put the best park in the world in the center of a sea of asphalt and someone will drive from that house, you know, over exactly. on the lower side. They'll have exactly. to drive to the park, which is exactly. what we just don't want, you know, for well, climate yeah, action yeah. or anything else. I had that conversation, uh, you know, in, in talking with uh, Trust for Public Land about their 10 minute, you know, park initiative is that everybody should be within, you know, a 10 minute walk of, of a park. And, uh, it, and, and I kind of said, well, and, or also, you know, within a, an easy bike ride too. Let's, let's kind of, a, you know, look at that. And then let's have those parks have, have these places not be places where you, you feel like the only way you can get there safely is, is by driving there. Um, and, you know, are these parks, uh, you know, situated in such a way and these open spaces and green spaces, et cetera, situated so that, uh, you know, there's amenities there that can accommodate somebody showing up on a bike, you know, is there a place to lock? Are there, you know, uh, other comfort facilities there? But really, you know, getting to your point here of what we're talking about is this gentler density of creating, you know, this is a blending of both architecture and landscape architecture things, human dynamics, because we're creating uh, sociability. Uh, and this is what was really, really exciting uh, about that book. And it, it's, it, it also, this is how it manifests. This is what it looks like when you start to understand that, you know, it's all about creating more livable, high quality, so, more sociable places, uh, which, oh, by the way, are also good for active mobility. And oh, by the way, are also good for the climate. Yeah. And good for, you know, small business and good for people hanging out and getting to know each other. I mean, what I, this is a, a photograph that I, I, I like to call this uh, sort of a, a magical adjacency, which is that you've got a place to to get a beer over on the right. It's a little little shack with like beer and snacks, and then there's the picnic tables. There's no one driving on this this road in between. Although I think you can drive on it. if you have a delivery, you can drive on it. But it's basically a sort of safe street, and then you've got a park. And so you know, as a as a dad of two two young kids that like to run around, they do not want to hang out and sit with me while I talk to my friends. They want to go run. I want to sit and talk to my friends. So there's this magical thing that happens if you're if you're me as this sort of you know middle-aged dad drinking a beer is that I can watch my kids and they can be safe and I can have an adult conversation. In the U.S., so this is in, Den this is in Denmark in, in Copenhagen. Um, in in the U.S., what we have are these kind of atomized versions of this. Like we've got that park that you showed in the last slide, and then you've got the bar, which is somewhere else, or the beer garden, which is somewhere else. And then you've got, you know, you're, you're sort of socializing and doing different things with different people all happen in different places, and you have to drive to each one of them. You know, so I think the magic is when you put things that you sort of don't necessarily belong together, maybe in zoning, together on the plan, and then you can just stay longer, and it's a much nicer experience. 
And to be clear, too, um, you know, this this particular type of facility, the larger parks and the recreational fields and sport uh, facilities, um, those totally exist in in the Netherlands and totally exist in Denmark and all, all these other locations. And so you're going to have these larger types of environments, you know, th- that exist out there. The key is, is that you can get there by transit and you can get there by biking as well as many people can get there by walking too. So it, but what we're really talking about here is this mixing of having more opportunities in this gentler density, which supports active mobility and having more opportunities for some green space and smaller parks really brings back the, the whole parklet idea too. Yeah. Of trying to reclaim, you know, asphalt and, and, and trying to depave, if you will, and, and maybe building things into, you know, if you have infield development, you know, things, maybe you're tearing down a whole bunch of, you know, old structures or whatever and rebuilding, you can use sort of this concept that we see visualized here. I think the, the key is bringing safety especially for, you know, for kids, or if you're sort of socializing with people in your immediate neighborhood, bringing that sense of safety and enclosure and protection from traffic to a very accessible location. So, you know, this is a courtyard view. I think this is a, an Airbnb that I was, I was staying in recently. And, you know, you'll see in the sort of in the courtyard is where there is this great green space in a lot of um, these, these, these courtyard ring blocks. And, you know, Big parks are important. You you want to be able to get there. You want to be able to bike there. There's it, there's also some a scale. This kind of missing middle of landscape scale that we're missing in our cities in the U.S., which is where do you where do you socialize with your neighbors? You know, it, in a single family home environment, it's it's your backyards. But then when we look at sort of high density in the U.S., there's often not a lot of communal space that's very usable or very safe. So I think what's 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 really important here, and I mean, this is un- unlocking a space with almost zero mobility. You just walk out your door and it's right there. But that's, you know, that is a climate action, actually. You know, any park that you don't have to drive to is a positive journey. Yeah. And what's really, really interesting, too, about this is for some people, their resistance to change and the nimbyism to densification, even gentle density, is they're, they're like... Uh, you know, no, you don't understand. We love our house, our single family home with the backyard and the privacy that we have. And uh, so it's, we're not saying that, you know, you need to do that and everybody needs to do this, but you just mentioned it in terms of missing middle. The point is, is that, you know, in many communities around the globe, we have not been building uh, that missing middle stuff, something that where you're able to have some gentle density, you have an environment where you can share some collectively within your little pod, you know, uh, you know, some communal space, which is really kind of cool. It reminds me a lot of um, Ross Chapin's uh, pocket neighborhood you know, designs. And the reason why those are so incredibly uh, popular is because you have a cluster of, of housing around a central area. It creates neighborliness. Um, you still have layers of privacy so that you can still, you know, be able to separate, separate yourself when you, you need a little bit more privacy, but you also have a little bit more social cohesiveness, which is so incredibly helpful for health and well-being, especially the loneliness epidemic that we have uh, in so many of our car centric uh, societies. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's just the power of those kind of weak ties to make you feel seen and know that if you don't, you know, walk by someone's window, they might start to wonder about where you are and if you're okay, you know, we, not everything has to be, uh, deeply intimate friendships or, you know, bonds of like deep reciprocity, there's, there's a, there's a huge role for neighborliness. And when we see people kind of, you know, aging out of their suburban bigger house and trying to figure out where to go, they don't need all that space. What is the, what is the environment that's going to, to now kind of keep them hooked into society, which, you know, people, people live longer in, in old age when they feel more socially connected. A, and by the way, as you know, there's this great reciprocity between those folks and kids. 
young families coming up who can, I mean, I have, you know, neighbors across the street that are retired and their kids are out of the house and I'll ask them to watch my kids for a few minutes. You know, I mean, that, that is magical and gosh, it's so much more human and fun to do that than to try and like get on a website and look for a babysitter. So, you know, there's, it's, it, there's a win all around and it, and it starts spatially, you know, it starts by kind of uh, the neighborhood is, is sort of the rails that we put our behavior on, right? And so we 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 create those conditions, and then our and our choices then run on them later. You want to make you want to make that running of behavior super easy in the direction that you want it to go. You don't want it to be a struggle. Yeah, yeah. And you uh, channeled uh, you know that right in these photographs. You have both uh, some of the elderly folks there in the image, as well as some of the youngest. And I would even go so far as to say that you know. Uh, in in this type of an environment, in this gentle density sort of environment, you're able to have a whole stratification of those connections. Yes, you do have sort of the lighter ones where you're just like, you know, oh, I haven't seen him in a while or something like that. I kind of equate that to um, also the 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 lighter version of connectivity and connections that we have when we're walking and biking and using transit. Um, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's, you, you, oh, I recognize Blaine. Yeah. I, I don't know Blaine's name, but I recognize that dude, you know, he's always out biking familiar with strangers. Yeah, he's a familiar yeah. stranger. Um, all the way up to the stratification of, you know, you start to get to know your neighbors a little better and you may, you know, uh, end up having a meal in, in the central courtyard you know, that uh, together and that's, that, you know, takes it to that whole nother level. And, uh, you also see in these images here too, the infrastructure and the stratification starting to be built in, uh, to help support active mobility. So you have your, your little, you know, bike garage here that's been put together for the residents so that they're not feeling like they have to drag a bike up into their apartments or their condos or their homes. Yeah, and, and you know the that image on the left, what's going on there is the, in that courtyard there is a there's actually a, a parking garage underground, so there is a place to park. The the stairwell and elevator into the building pops into the courtyard. It doesn't pop into the building, right? So in, in an American apartment building, the your elevator from the parking garage will take you right up to your 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 floor and your door, and so. You don't have an opportunity to see any of your neighbors unless they live on your floor um, when you go up. In this in this design, you actually need to come through the courtyard. You pass the bikes, so you get this you know this social journey into the into the in the building. And maybe maybe you, maybe you don't meet anyone. Maybe you do. But I think there's sort of this recognition that it's important to have a public entry where you can see people. It's not all about efficiency. And, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with walking outside for 15 seconds. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, the, the trade-off is worth it. Um, so there's like little details like that are, are just like, we, you know, we could learn so much from them. And I think it's, it's really about kind of starting from this place of, yeah, we're trying to maximize for density. We're trying to make, you know, put, fit a lot of people into this building. We're also trying to optimize for sociability too. I think if you approach it as a, as a designer with that in mind, it, it starts to, you know, point you towards, towards certain decisions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually do want to um, uh, go back to, to this series of photos because there's there's two more that I, I want to you know, emphasize. And it is kind of the, this kind of exemplifies that interaction that we were just talking about where, you know, these chance interactions, you know, can happen very, very organically. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is this is some photos from. I think Sweden, and then there's I think the part, the the one on the lower right might be in Germany or Austria. But you know, it's just it's important to think about informality and and sort of there's a few things happening in these humble photos, which is which are actually sophisticated in in terms of the design. But you know, there's a private space, and there are these cues to where the private space transitions, and there's a transition zone, and then the interior of the courtyard is a controlled semi-private space it's some of them are open to the public some of them are, are not but it is a you know it's signaled as a community space so you know as, as humans we're we're very attuned to who we know and who we don't know and 
that needs to sort of be reflected in the built environment. So you can think of all of these these building edges and courtyards as being, you know, technology for fostering and maintaining good, you know, social relationships, good community relationships. And we need we need boundaries, right? We don't we don't want to. I mean, one of the things you do see in a lot of U.S apartments is, you know, you have sort of a token decorative courtyard, sort of a, a sort of a smoking porch or, you know, Juliet balcony right off of, you know, and it's not very private, you know, it's maybe like who wants to live like right, right there, you know, in, in full view of everyone. So you, you do need some, some delineation of that, of that private realm, but it needs to be permeable too. And um, I think there's something really magical about being able to go kind of right from your dining room outside and then go grill like, you know, outside with your neighbors. I'm, I'm grinning ear to ear because uh, these are literally the same words that Ross Chapin used in uh, uh, in the video that I produced um, highlighting pocket neighborhoods and talking about those layers and that transition and the permeability and, you know, the sociability that goes with that. So I'll make sure I, I put a link to that video in this this, uh, uh, you know, podcast episode as well. Talk a little bit about uh, what we're looking at here. Yeah, it, this is an image of uh, Bo 01 in Malmo, Sweden. And the open door there is uh, to my, my colleague, Ava Vestermark's apartment. And when I'm, when I'm in town, I usually, you know, when I'm in Copenhagen, I usually call up Ava and invite myself over for a beer and a swim in the, in the ocean next to her house. And I, I just, this, you know, I just like this photo because it's, it's just simple. I mean, it's, there's not a lot going on in it. I mean, there's a cat, <laughs> but you can drive on the street. If you can believe it, if you, if you want to get, you know, if you want to unload a sofa or something, you can get it down there. And it's like super hard to drive down the street. And I asked Ava one time, cause she's, she's an architect. And I, th- I think she actually worked on this, this project back in the day. And Bo one is a, maybe we can, we can put a, a link to the, um, to the project in the show notes or something, but it's a, it's a, seminal um, sort of exposition um, neighborhood that was designed in Sweden to kind of test out a lot of these ideas around, around new building types and courtyards and community. And I asked, I asked Ava, you know, what, how did you guys get this through the fire department? And she's like, it was hard. Actually, we had to clip the buildings in different places. And, but we just kind of knew we wanted really small streets. So we just worked really hard at it. And anyway, you know, she just leaves the door open and neighbors walk by and it's her kids kind of run around out there and stuff. So it's, it's all about having this like super informal space outside your house. I'm so glad you mentioned that about the, you know, the, the fire department and all that, because oftentimes it just gets kind of, you know, oh, well, it's Europe, they, they can do stuff and we just can't do it because, you know, our fire departments won't let us do it. And, and it's like, oh, well, you know, it's like, no, it, sometimes it's hard for them to do it too. And, and you have to, you know, have that negotiation and those compromises that take place. Uh, but yeah, we, honestly, we shouldn't be designing our communities and our streets, you know, for the size of the equipment that we have, we probably should be looking at ways to be able to uh, do the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Design the communities because- that we want and need, and then look at the equipment. I, you know, I am, I am uh, here in Berkeley. We're having a, a controversy about putting bike lanes on a, on a shopping street. And there are tough questions about, you know, the fire equipment that can go down the street. And of course that becomes a wedge issue with people who um, oppose bike lanes for all kinds of funny reasons. Y- you know, it's, it's politically impossible to say we're not going to, you know, let a fire truck come down the street. Right. I mean, it's, you, that's sort of, it is, it is kryptonite for, um, for bike lanes. You don't want to get into that territory, but I think one of the, you know, the trickier conversations is like, look, bike lanes are a public safety issue too. You know, one is an acute, you know, emergency access is an acute safety issue. Bike lanes are a systemic long-term safety issue. A lot of the calls that fire trucks are actually going to serve our injuries on our streets. So we got to link up these conversations. And when you talk to fire officials, you know, for the most part, actually, these are people who are deeply committed to saving lives, protecting people, protecting, protecting communities. So, you know, that's, that's very much the starting point. And I think we're, we're still, we're, we're wrestling with uh, the, the reality of bigger and bigger fire vehicles 
you know, which just make, makes the equation harder. But um, it, it should really be about, you know, a general public safety conversation. And I'll give a shout out to, you know, our fire chief here in um, in Austin, uh, you know, he came with us uh, on a study tour uh, to the Netherlands in, in 2019. And, you know, we went out of our way to stop at several of the fire stations there in the Netherlands. And, and you know, he had, you know, some hard questions, you know, about the size of the equipment, the number of people that they were able to uh, deploy to a call. Uh, so, Ultimately, the bottom line is, is that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And we can be able to, um, I think, downsize the size of our streets and create more people oriented dimensions, more human centered uh, dimensions so that uh, they're safer and more inviting for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and hey, never we should never lose sight of the fact that we are usually having these tough conversations about geometry in the US by working around parked cars. So there's there's almost always, you know, eight or nine more feet you can get uh, for the fire department if you get rid of if you get rid of parking. <laughs> right, right, right. Blaine, we've come to our end. What have we not talked about that you really want to leave the audience with? Well, you know, I I am currently thinking a lot about how all the things we just talked about enable a certain emissions profile for for residents of cities and you know if you um, maybe we can we can put a link to to this in in the show you know there's there's a great study that was posted in the new york times a, a few weeks ago kind of showing the carbon intensity of um different neighborhoods and the you know the spoiler alert is that yeah if you if you live in a dense walkable neighborhood your carbon footprint is a lot lower than someone who doesn't. I mean, I think we we know this. The the the, the modeling data actually really shows it. And UC Berkeley, same same uh, research organization that that is behind these maps, looked at what is the number one policy that your city can implement to lower its carbon footprint. And for most dense areas with transit, that policy is infill transit oriented development and reducing VMT. It is more than heat pumps. It's more than changing your diet. It's more than even in some cases, electrification, which obviously all this is a both and yes, and all these things. But when we think about priorities, when you think about the levers to putting behavior on rails and getting it to go where you want it to go, Behavior is a huge lever. It's a huge scaling lever, right? We need to be thinking about neighborhoods and, and neighborhood design and, and mobility design as, as one of these big levers. So, you know, I think this, this is, it's a, it's a huge opportunity to kind of overlay two wins on top of each other. We can create neighborhoods that are safer, more fun, make us happier, make us more connected, healthier, all those things that we know, we know walking and cycling do for us. And we can be showing the way to a more climate positive, lower emissions future. So to me, it's like, why wouldn't we be doing both of these things all, all the time? It's, it's a clear win. And that's kind of the argument that I intend to keep making out there over the next uh, few few years in this kind of urgent moment where we need both of these things to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm listening to uh, Greta's book right now, uh, The Climate Book. And uh, obviously we just uh, got a report out this week, not a very good report on the climate um, issue. Uh, do you want to address that at all? Because I feel as if we're sort of like hacking at, at the branches of evil and not getting to the root of the problem and we're not moving with a sense of urgency that we really need to be moving at? It, it, you know, it's, it's tough. I mean, I, I, we all, we all are looking at what's happening and realizing that we are not making the progress that we need to be making at the speed we need to make it. And I, I don't have an easy answer to that. I think we all come to this, this kind of reality that's in our heads that, you know, maybe keeps us up at night. I, I see colleagues who are changing careers like monthly people, you know, I, I hear about another colleague who's trying to move into the climate space because they are just asking themselves, what am I doing? What am I doing with this, with this unique moment in human history 
where our actions matter so much. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't have the answer of how to make this move faster politically at the sort of level that it needs to happen, you know, in the U S and, and globally. But I, I personally feel that we, you know, I want to be sort of working with every fiber of my, my being in the way that I know how, which is designing neighborhoods and just sort of aligning that with what needs to be done. And I, I think that that actually kind of sends a message culturally to our community when we see people doing that, when we see like, hey, there's not there's not time to be doing anything else. Like you should still do what you know how to do. I'm not going to change careers and become a atmospheric scientist, but I am going to sort of go deeper and commit myself more to this, you know, idea of active, active streets and neighborhoods because it's it's what I can do. It's how I can help. Yeah. And I'll say this um, on, on behalf of, you know, the content that I'm creating. I don't typically lead with climate issues, you know, here on the Active Towns channel. Um, I usually lead with, you know, images of, you know, positivity and uh, and that this is possible and we can move forward. But I will say this. We need to move with much more of a sense of urgency. We need to make things happen. And if we have to, we can we can do what we are seeing here on the screen in these images. Uh, we can move lighter, quicker, cheaper. We can make this happen uh, very, very quickly. What we're talking about here really is redefining space that's already been paved and we're just making some tweaks to be able to, to do that. You can always come back later and make it beautiful from the architect's perspective and from the landscape design perspective and from the water quality management perspective. We can bring in your rain gardens later and permeability. We can do all these things later, but we need to move quickly and it, we, we're running out of time. So we I think that, you know, ultimately, uh, I know how hard it is because block by block, you know, you've got endless meetings and things and people are rightfully so concerned about what happens in their in their spaces, their public realm, their streets, um, their parking spot in front of their home. Uh, these are all concerns and legitimate concerns. And in some neighborhoods, some communities that have been, uh, shall we say, you know, disinvested in and ignored uh, or even had, you know, bad things happen to them by the government, they're very distrustful of things happening from upon high and then coming down. But we need a sea change of movement um, happening, uh, leadership from above, but also from the ground up. And so that would be my, you know, sort of, you know, motivational pitch to this episode to close us out is, yeah, we do need to move quickly and we do need to speak up as members of our community, get together with your neighbors, start talking about these issues and start, you know, thinking about ways that we can do this kind of stuff in a lighter, quicker, cheaper manner. Yeah. And I think it, it's, it's, you know, you get so many different benefits for different reasons when you, when you do make those changes. And I think, you know, bringing in the climate, the climate argument, it helps convince some other people maybe that weren't on board before. And that's, that's my hope is that we can just by showing how, you know, safety, happiness, exercise, connection overlap with climate action, you're making the tent bigger and you're giving, you're giving sort of more wind in the sails than, than there was before. So I, I look at that as a good thing and, and just kind of bringing kind of more people into the conversation. I love it. Blaine Merker, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast today. Yeah, thanks, John, for having me. It's been great. I really enjoyed it. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Blaine Merker. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. Most importantly, share it with a friend. We do need to spread these messages. Uh, and if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below, ring the notifications bell right next to it so that you can customize your notification preferences. Uh, I have another episode coming up real soon. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.